lots to digest this morning. We've started to the new trading month. Uh, we've also got uh, that earthquake that emerged out of Chile, and this is expected to boost copper prices. In fact, all metal stocks are enjoying gains this morning. Yeah, as far as I can understand it, there are two Codelco mines that are, remember, a lot of the mining region falls quite far to the north. So um, as far as I could understand, there were electricity supply problems at Anglo-Americans Los Broncos mine and then at two key Codelco mines. Um, but the big, big ones further north, as far as I could understand it, were fine. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess it all goes back to how you're going to ship it out, you know, and if you've got less resources to deal with and those resources are aimed at um, obviously cleaning up uh, in the aftermath of the quack, then yeah, sure, certainly they're going to be. And I saw the copper price had already spiked in the futures market mm. about 3.5%. Well, it's quite interesting. It is the world's biggest copper producer, but the question is, is the rally going to be sustained? Because it all depends uh, on the demand that's going to be coming through from China. That's a good point, because um, someone said, here's the real reason, and it was that South Korean exports had surged dramatically, and I think 38% increase to China and a 14% increase to, to the US. People are starting to say, well, check, here's the emergence of, of, of the Chinese consumer, and here's where the real demand is going to come from in years to come. So it was quite interesting that the, the, the two events coincided, and people are just attributing it to one specifically. But you must remember that South Korea exports um, plasma screens, you, you know, almost anything that an electronics fundy could want. Um, and there isn't a certain amount of copper usage mm -hmm. inside of those electronics. So interesting that some people use that story alongside the earthquake supply story as, as two reasons why copper prices going forward should sustain mm -hmm. these high, high levels. Interestingly, still a long way off our highs, um, about 80 to 90 cents a US pound off our highs, uh, per pound off our highs. So, uh, you know, it all, 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 it, it all, it's, it's all on what your outlook on what the world is going to look like in five years' time. Is there going to be a strong Chinese consumer? Is there going to be an emergence of an Indian consumer, Southeast Asia? I don't know. I think the short answer to that is very definitely yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, iron ore prices here in South Africa under the spotlight. A lot of controversy regarding iron ore prices uh, emerging from China because we know that China has tried to bring those prices down uh, over the last while or so. Arsenal Metal losing quite a significant contract, a Chinese contract. Now the bombshell dropped Friday actually is around the Sishin iron, um, Sishin iron ore contract that Arsenal Metal would have had um, with Sishin Iron Ore. Now you must remember Sishin Iron Ore Company is 74% owned by Kumba Iron Ore. 20% owned by Exara, and then Staffers and Empowerment uh, Group owns the other 6%. Now, they've been selling this iron ore to ArcelorMittal at cost plus 3%. So people have worked out that, including transport, that's somewhere around $20 a tonne. Now, bearing in mind that in the spot market, it's trading at five and a half, six times more than that. So the, the effect to even if they start selling it back to ArcelorMittal at market-related prices, um, the effect to, to ArcelorMittal is pretty dramatic. I think it's as much as 750 million US dollars. And obviously, for uh, the Sishin Iron Ore Company, for the likes of Kumba and Exara, it's hugely positive. Now, it all has to do with um, ArcelorMittal not having followed and converted their old order mining rights. So it will be open to some sort of arbitration. But if ArcelorMittal um, don't get this contract renewed in the way it was, because of historical reasons, because as you can remember, all three of these companies were in some way involved in one company back in 2001, before the Kumba Resources and the, uh, the, the ESCOR split. That's the predecessor to ArcelorMittal. So you had to delve back into the um, history books to be reminded why there was such a stupid contract in the first place. As Barry Sargent from MineWeb, he said the most bizarre mining contract anywhere in the world. Who would produce at cost plus 3%? But obviously in 2001, the shareholder mix of all these companies was very different. I mean, the, the Indians weren't involved in ArcelorMittal yet. Plus Anglo wasn't a big shareholder inside of Kumba Resources, Kumba Iron Ore. So the mix in shareholders that has changed over the last decade has probably led us to this point mm -hmm. where you see this contract being disputed because it's not beneficial for the new shareholders of, you know, the people who've, who've got the biggest part of the uh, Sishin Iron Ore Company, Kumba Resources, and obviously it's a lot more beneficial to ArcelorMittal. And the shareholder mix and the shareholder base has changed dramatically over that time too.
Mm. Well, looking at what ArcelorMittal's next move should be, you mentioned that we'll be you know, seeing quite a lot of arbitration coming through on that front and, and regarding the contract. Uh, where do you think this is going to lead to, uh, Sasha? Do you think we'll be seeing an increase in those prices for ArcelorMittal? Do you think that's, that's going to be the way out? It has to be. I think, I think it has to be because you can't sit with such a preferential contract for an extended period of time. Even though ArcelorMittal wanted to participate in the expansion of Sishan Iron Ore, because you must remember that uh, that has ramped up dramatically, and again, their customer base at Sishan Iron Ore has also changed. So much so that they're the fourth largest seaborne, Kumba, Kumba Iron Ore is the fourth largest seaborne um, trader of, 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 of iron ore. And, and of course, it's, it pales into insignificance when compared to Vale Rio and BHP. Mm -hmm. But still, they're at that sort of size and scale. And I think they represent about 4% of all world um, uh, seaborne trade. And I think that the mix that you've seen change over the years and more reliance, less reliance, sorry, on a, a European and local customers and more reliance on, on Chinese, Indian, et cetera, has led them to this point to realize that that contract was for a very different global scenario. And this new one needs to be, well, to suit their mix.